And it's great to join you today for what I'm really looking forward to. I think it's going to be a fantastic hour and a half discussion. Um, yes, indeed, I am in what used to be the tech capital of the world. We here still, obviously still think it is, um, but we're glad that the rest of you are joining in and enjoying some of the fruits of this too. It, it was way overdue and I'm glad it's finally happening. Um, so uh, without further ado, let me just introduce uh, Vitalik Buterin. Uh, as Richard pointed out, he really needs no introduction, but I'm going to give you a very quick one anyway. Um, 10 years ago, an absolute lifetime, obviously, in crypto terms, um, he discovered blockchain technology, went on to become co-founder of Bitcoin magazine, and then just two years later, wrote the white paper for Ethereum. And, you know, way back then, he laid out his vision for what, in high, even now, it seems an amazing thing, the idea of a generalized framework that can handle completely decentralized applications and contracts. Such a kind of sweeping idea. And we've had eight years now to kind of work, work with this. Um, and uh, we've, got, we've got a lot of questions, you know, about, I mean, you know, almost throughout that time, people have talked about how it's going to scale, how it's going to adapt. Um, you know, we're right on the brink of um, potentially, you know, all kinds of applications that are, that are starting to flood onto the network. So um, uh, he's now chief scientist and a researcher at Ethereum, spends a lot of his time building. Um, I personally, you know, I'm very interested in what his priorities are, how he's thinking about how he introduces this, this network into a wider world, because I meet so many people now who want to understand it, who have questions about how it's going to impact them and their industries, uh, how it's regulated, you know, all kinds of issues. So I, I'm very interested in how he, you know, he's personally thinking about how he resolves that and gets us out into the wider world. So, um, Tom, I'm very glad to be joined by Tom here. Uh, Vitalik, we're going to do a double act on you. I'm afraid we're going to gang up on you. Um, just in case you try and slip out of any uh, any particular hard questions. Oh, amazing. Um, as, I, <laughs> as I say, we've got an hour and a half. We're going to have plenty of time for questions at the end. So please, uh, audience out there, please post your questions on, on, on Hope In. I'm going to try and pack in a lot of short questions at the end. So make your questions short, put them in throughout, mm. and we'll pack in as many as we can. So with, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Tom. Tom. So Vitaly, we thought we'd uh, start by asking for just a quick synopsis of your uh, early life. I mean, I guess you probably had uh, neural biases towards science anyway, but uh, kind of parental influences that took you into maths and computer science. And I thought maybe it'd be nice to hear, is there some uh, illustrative hard problem you thought a lot about or solved or fascinated by that's kind of emblematic of things mm. that you enjoyed at that age? Uh, I mean, before I discovered Bitcoin, like I was basically just programming video games. Like I would just make a game. Like I would like, make make either Space Invaders or like some other similar game, and then I would play it until I get bored, and then I would make another game. So that was uh, the bulk of the yeah, programming that I would be doing before I uh, discovered the, possi the that it's uh, possible to actually apply programming to you know do things in the crypto space or any or or other spaces um you know learns a lot of math at the same time my parents were very supportive they would always buy books and uh, kind of get me into some you know, like special classes to help me learn to program better um and then eventually of course i yeah, discovered uh, bitcoin in early 2011 which was uh interesting because it uh, kind of really combines together a lot of my existing interests so I, I had already been interested in the concept of open source software. I had already you know, been really into math, uh, really into programming, and real, also just really interested in some of the you know, philosophical aspects of like what Bitcoin is and uh, what Bitcoin could do for the world. So, you know, it was, I guess the, the ecosystem was a very natural fit for me, uh, for me from uh, a fairly early on. So early on, you, I mean, we had in uh, Bitcoin the system that sat at the, in the crosshairs of a lot of your, your interests, economics, mm. and science, maths. Um, if you go back to 2013, uh, mm. you uh, were basically sat down with uh, some sort of blank sheet of paper. You assembled these now quite storied uh, figures like Gav Wood, Joe Lubin. There's a kind of cast of about, I think, six, seven characters. Mm. Um, and you're writing this first blueprint, basically mm. limitless degrees of freedom. Uh, you could 
presumably had to guess at a lot of the constraints and trade-offs you were eventually going to face. Instruction mm. sets, data structures, block sizes, block times, um, all these decisions, and you're starved of all this future information. How, how did you cut through all that? Mm. Well, let's see. I guess, like, first of all, I definitely don't think I did a perfect job, right? Like, because, uh, you know, even right now, and we're going to talk a bit about the Ethereum roadmap, I guess, so later on, but some of the things that we're doing in some ways is just reversing some of the decisions that we made early on, like things around, um, you know, making state objects uh, last forever and like having 20 byte addresses, having protrusion trees, and a whole bunch of these uh, technical decisions that, I mean, in, a lot of, they were not perfect. Um, I think a, a lot of them came from just looking at the systems that existed at the time and kind of seeing what things worked well, seeing what the failures are. Um, so, you know, Bitcoin was obviously the major uh, kind of blockchain that was the template for everything else that existed at that point. And so Ethereum borrowed a lot of ideas from uh, Bitcoin. It borrowed a lot of ideas from the uh, kind of quote Bitcoin 2.0 protocols that I was. Uh, in the communities of at the time. So I had spent a month in uh, Israel before I uh, started working on Ethereum and Israel's got, you know, great mathematicians, great cryptographers, great computer scientists. And there were people working on covered coins. There were, you know, very smart mathematicians like Mandy Rosenfeld, just like doing all sorts of blockchain analysis. There were people working on financial protocols uh, like MasterCoin. And so I saw some of those ideas. Um, I uh, saw some ideas in Bitcoin, some of the technical ideas in like Ripple, like the uh, Patricia tree, for example. Like, at least the idea came from uh, came from there. So, and then of course there was this idea of like taking all of these pieces together and coming up with a general purpose programming language. Um, and of course, like the, there was uh, the uh, opportunity to uh, just learn from uh, failures as well, right? So to learn from, you know, some of the technical limitations that, like, for example, I saw the Bitcoin protocol as having, um, and ev not even just technical limitations, but also kind of ecosystem limitations. Like, for example, like the fact that Bitcoin has one very dominant client, that's uh, something that like I saw running as uh, something that can easily become a source of problems. It can lead to you know, the ecosystem being brittle. It can lead to political centralization. And so the decision to have Ethereum be a system that just has multiple clients, like multiple implementations of uh, the protocol that were written um, independently came from there. So you know, it was this big combination of ideas, right? Just looking at what I saw as being mistakes of existing platforms, what I saw as being things that existing platforms did great. And like. Uh, this a new idea of uh, creating a general purpose platform and just kind of combining all those pieces together. I mean, as a as a general purpose platform, I mean, like like all systems like this, you don't know at the outset what it's going to be used for. That is the mm -hmm. entire point. But mm -hmm. did you did you have a any thought in your mind back then of DeFi, which mm -hmm. is, you know, mm -hmm. so so one question I've had is that finance you know is finance the the initial killer application if you like for blockchains mm. you've obviously seen bitcoin but you know I, a lot of people have thought about uh web 3.0 and you know data and how you can how you can make more private applications and so on but it does seem that finance is the kind of breakthrough thing here is is that right and and did, you know could you have foreseen this did you foresee this I kind of feel like I did. Like the, the Ethereum white paper had a you know, list of uh, kind of suggested applications in it, right? I talked about contracts for difference. I think prediction markets were in there. Um, so both of those are DeFi. I think stable coins may, well, I don't think they were in the white paper, but they were in a post in early 2014. So they were, and we talk a lot about stable coins now. Um, also non DeFi things like DAOs uh, were in there as well. Uh, so, uh, decentralized domain name registries. I talked about that a lot, and now we have ENS. Uh, so I feel like we uh, understood even back then what a lot of the uh, applications are, but there were also a lot of things that we missed, right? Like NFTs would be one example of something I missed. Like I even remember, I think I was on a panel, may have been in San Francisco, maybe somewhere else, uh, a couple of years ago, where I was asked what I thought was overrated and what was underrated. And I uh, decided we put NFTs in the overrated section. And, uh, you know, I, I proved to be a, 
a little bit uh, incorrect on that, of course. Uh, but uh, so, you know, it's a, it's a mixed bag. I feel like we uh, saw some of the things, but also didn't see some of the things. Well, why, what, why decentralized finance rather than other decentralized applications? Obviously, the ICO mm -hmm. kind of mania was, you know, throw everything at the wall and see what sticks and not much mm -hmm. did. Why, mm -hmm. why finance? I think there's a couple answers for this. Um, so one of them is that um, the specific thing that blockchains provide that like either open source software pre-blockchain, like self-hosted software, or even just like peer-to-peer -peer networks like BitTorrent don't provide is um, that blockchains provide this concept of state, this concept of memory, kind of collective memory of the network that the, mem that the network maintains according to uh, the rules of the network and you can distinguish between like who's the first person to perform an action who's the second person to perform some action and that like there are a lot of applications that do not require that right like a uh, file sharing for example right like that that just requires BitTorrent. it does not require a blockchain and i think it just so happens that like money is one type of uh, use case that really benefits from state because like money fundamentally is state, right? Like it's, right. you have to remember like how many coins everyone has. That's one aspect. Um, another aspect I think is that our financial systems uh, do lag behind um, the rest of our applications in quality, right? Like you can send an email in like one second, but like sending money to someone is not something that you can as easily do in one second. I mean, I think things have improved over the last 10 years and there's often like systems that work within one country that can do really fast the transfers, but especially if you're being doing things internationally, like that just doesn't exist yet, right? Um, so finance is one space where I think it's just easier for uh, cryptocurrency to improve on the status quo. Um, so that's another reason. A third reason why I think finance has dominated now is, uh, and like, and I think has even dominated to a greater extent than I would prefer it to dominate is uh, because like right now we do have this uh, scaling crisis, right? The uh, demand for blockchain usage and it exceeds the supply. And so transaction fees have gone really high and like financial applications just are the kind of applications that can afford to pay transaction fees, right? Like it's much easier to uh, convince someone to pay a dollar for uh, to right. send uh, some money around than it is to convince someone to pay a, a dollar for like an email or you know whatever other kind of non-financial thing but that's something that i'm hoping is going to decrease over the next couple of years as we do self scaling got it all right i've got a couple more questions on on DeFi. we're not going to spend all this conversation but it's what i'm hearing most about so now i've got you we ought to plug you on this so so uh, you talk about you know those basic functions that that the that your blockchain is well suited for in finance um, clearly, you know, you build up applications out of different functions and the potential mm -hmm. here is what can you assemble? But is it, um, is, is this network going to be able to replicate all of the functions in the financial system? So for instance, an order book and the provision mm -hmm. of liquidity in some of these issues mm -hmm. at a very core to the markets, I hear people mm -hmm. saying, you know, this is, you simply can't do this on a blockchain. Um, how do you feel about mm -hmm. this? Do you think we can replicate all of finance on blockchains? Um, I mean, for order books specifically, I think the answer mm -hmm. is like you can, but it's inefficient, right? And the challenge is that like the kinds of things that are optimal to implement on blockchains are different than the kinds of designs that are optimal to implement on other systems, uh, just uh, because uh, transactions on blockchains are more expensive. You have this kind of 12 uh, second tick time instead of uh, being able to do things every like 10 milliseconds. Um, so, you know, we had things like uh, Uniswap on chain and Uniswap has yeah. been extremely successful, right? But at the same time, like there are still order books and there's still centralized exchanges. And there's also these uh, kind of semi-centralized blockchains that have uh, um, arisen over the last year or so. Um, so you know, there's definitely some designs where um, like you do need some kind of more high performance environment. Though, I mean, I expect even Ethereum itself is going to be capable of becoming a more high-performance environment over time as uh, our scaling efforts come to bear some fruit. Um, there are aspects of finance that I do think are inherently not blockchain-friendly, right? Like one just simple example is uh, like in finance, 
assets in general, like most assets are either debt or they're promises of some kind, right? And so most assets are inherently not trustless in that sense. And if he wants to have an asset that's not, that depends on that kind of trust, like actually be something that's stable and works, like, you know, he needs to have some kind of extra protocol, like legal system or some other kind of assurance um, that, you know, who, um, the asset actually is going to uh, kind of get whatever claims the asset's supposed to have, right? And that's something that like you can't entirely put on chain. Um, so, and we've already been seeing, right? There's these asset backed stable coins oh. and like USDC and then USDT. And uh, there's all these concerns about USDT kind of not being very trustworthy because of, uh, you know, what it's backed by and its legal structure. And then, but, and then there's USDC and then like GUSD and all these sorts of alternatives. Um, so it's uh, like there's a big room for applications that are not purist in their blockchaining and in their decentralization and that combine elements of blockchains and uh, decentralization with uh, those uh, elements of uh, traditional finance. And I think we are going to see a lot of uh, applications like that as well. Um, so, yeah, so I think, uh, you know, blockchains can be really useful, but they're not going to, like, you know, literally create this kind of utopian zero trust uh, global financial system all by themselves. Got it. Um, one more question on, on DeFi while we've got you on this one, and I'll hand back to Tom. But um, so last week, Dan Berkowitz, who's a CFTC commissioner, um, you know, gave a speech. And you can always tell when regulators mm. are starting to catch up with something because he started mm. out in his comments talking about Wikipedia. He, he mm. read a definition of DeFi to the audience in Wikipedia, which kind mm. of tells me that they're right at the beginning here of trying to work out what the heck this is. But mm -hmm. his basic point was um, financial regulation works by regulating intermediaries. Intermediaries mm -hmm. both provide tremendous value to the markets. You know, they provide liquidity, advice, mm -hmm. all those things. Um, but they also can be regulated. And if you're a regulator, mm -hmm. you know, you want to get your arms around something. Mm -hmm. DeFi, by definition, will not allow that. And he mm -hmm. simply said, look, do we want this? I mean, isn't this what happened in shadow banking? Mm -hmm. um, think, things leaking outside regulatory control. Um, mm. how, do you, how do you respond to that? I mean, can, can regulators and in, indeed can society trust and feel that it controls what is happening in DeFi? Mm. So I think uh, my answer definitely have a few different parts to it. Uh, so first, I think like, I am not a uh, defender or a proponent of everything that happens in DeFi. Uh, so like my opinion of uh, the things that are good and, and important in DeFi is that the, the good and important things are the boring things, right? Like you have assets, you have stable coins, uh, you have the ability to exchange be between different assets. Um, like there's also some of this more exotic stuff like, you know, 347% a year yield farming or um, like extreme leverage trading and those kinds of things. And like... If all of those uh, disappeared tomorrow, I personally would not shed that many tears. Um, and like, you know, there are serious risks in a lot of those kinds of designs. And I at least uh, do what I can to kind of caution people about them and just remind them that, you know, um, risks in those kinds of systems actually do exist. Um, and in, in terms of uh, what regulators can do and what regulators will do, I mean, I think, uh, like they don't have the uh, ability to just prevent these uh, systems from existing completely, but they definitely do have a lot of uh, levers by which they can significantly, uh, or uh, if it's seriously reduce the amount of liquidity that's happening on them, right? Uh, because uh, you know if it uh, you know becomes illegal for institutions to uh, uh, to participate in these systems, then like liquidity is going to decrease by uh, by quite a lot. Um, so. I think, um, you know, there's definitely limits to the extent to which um, any of these things can uh, uh, kind of actually go up, like run out of anyone's control, regardless of, uh, like, I guess, w what anyone in the, in the DeFi space wants them to be. Um, and also, I get, yeah, so I guess I think I would uh, kind of ju judge the De the DeFi space on a very case by case basis. Like I think there's some places where like De it actually has shown that you know it, like DeFi is 
capable of being very financially stable and it's uh, capable of uh, you know surviving and handling sure. pretty extreme market events right like if you look at stable coins like die and ride they're perfectly capable of surviving the underlying collateral like ETH just falling an entire 50 percent in a single day right? right so there's parts of DeFi that i think work uh uh, quite well, and I, I would even say they uh, contribute to stability much more than they contribute to instability. But then you know, there's also other parts of DeFi that are definitely uh, both risky for their users and potentially uh, ris uh, risky for the market as well. And in, in that case, it's uh, a different, definitely a different issue. I mean, I expect I expect those systems to have regulatory challenges. I mean, I definitely expect a couple of those systems to just break at some points because well, because, well that's something that's uh, already happened historically. Um, but, you know, we'll see. Like, I, I definitely expect the DeFi space to be uh, sort of somewhat more more normalized over the next uh, over the next couple of years, both in terms of like how people treat it and in terms of what's actually happening there. Right. Cool. So, Vitaly, we're going to uh, mm -hmm. move on and uh, zoom into um, we're going to put a window really up to the sort of the machinery uh, underpinning underpinning Ethereum. Um, try and mm -hmm. hopefully give people some uh, some mental imagery to come away from mm -hmm. this talk uh, with, particularly where they may not be very familiar with with what's going on. So, uh, just kind of as a very brief bit of context before I wade into the main question, which is, um, what is the state of Ethereum? You, you mentioned before. Uh, these things, Patricia trees. So can you throw a light on where everything's stored? What are these Merkle trees and, and who is Patricia? Mm, yes. Uh, so, right. So the word state in a blockchain context has this very particular meaning, right? The state is uh, basically things like account balances, smart contract code, memory inside of smart contracts, or, or what we call storage. Like uh, basically, information that reflects kind of the current status of applications running inside of Ethereum. And it's the information that future transactions are authenticated against. So usually state is contrasted with history, um, right? So state is like where we are now and history is how we got there. Um, and history tends to be much bigger than state, right? Because there's a lot of things that get um, like in applications where the same object gets interacted with many times and the state would only be like the, what the current position of that or like data in that object is, but the history would be like the entire set of updates that happened until that point. Um, so history theoretically is easier to deal with because you can just forget history beyond a certain point. State is a challenge because at least given how state works today, as state is ever growing, right? The state is around 100 gigabytes. It's gaining something where like uh, about 50 gigabytes a year. And so over time, the uh, network becomes more bulky and more difficult to participate in. Um, and so this includes like things like, you know, as I mentioned, like the balances of every account, the code of every smart contract on Ethereum, if smart contracts store information in their storage, um, then that, that also is a part of state. Uh, so in order to deal with uh, this uh, problem of uh, growing state size, um, like there's a few different solutions, right? So one of the solutions is, um, kind of layer two protocols, right? So we basically say, okay, we admit that there are some uh, limits to the efficiency of layer one. And so instead uh, we have these uh, mech protocols like rollups are a big example that use the blockchain and that benefit from the blockchain security, but they only need to put a little bit of information and a little bit of computation onto the blockchain. Most activity happens in a separate protocol that happens somewhere else off chain. Right, but be, they use the blockchain just enough that they still benefit from the, the, the blockchain security properties. And so they still present the same security guarantees to their users that an application running on chain would. It's just that like you don't actually have to calculate these the updates to the state inside the rollup that are happening unless you personally are participating in that particular rollup. Um, so it's kind of like scaling by separation of concerns, right? Like every user only really cares about their own sort of sub universe. And there's a little bit of uh, stuff that all users have to care about, but like it's much less than everyone's activity. Um, so then rollups can implement kind of like more efficient ways of handling things like state internally. And then the blockchain itself is just a kind of verifying data, verifying proofs. And so it can be lighter, right? So that's technique one. 
And the nice thing about technique one is that it's happening in parallel to all the other techniques. There are already rollups, um, like Loop Ring is uh, one big example, ZK Sync is another big example, that have already been running on top of Ethereum for more than one year. Um, so they've already been, but these rollups, they do have fairly limited functionality right now. They only support payments, right? And they only support a couple of limited applications. So the thing that's, that's happening this year is we're getting uh, smart contract capable rollups. Uh, so rollups that are capable of supporting the full range of applications that you can run on Ethereum itself. And there is, uh, you know, this set of household names of uh, projects that are doing this. There's Optimism, there's Arbitrum, there's ZK Sync, uh, there's a Starkware. I, yeah, I think those are the leading four at this point. Uh, so a lot of excellent progress happening there. And a lot, a lot of those projects have test networks of some kind or, or even limited mainnet releases of some kind already. Um, so that's rollups, right? And with rollups, you can theoretically scale app applications by a factor of about 100. Uh, so you can go from about 20 transactions a second to somewhere between 1,000 and 4,000 transactions a second, depending on what, it, what kinds of uh, transactions it is that you're running. So that's one thing that you can do. Another thing that you can do is, of course, keep things on the base layer and improve the base layer protocol itself. Um, so the two techniques that we talk about the most, one of them is called statelessness and the other is called state expiry. Um, so state expiry is easy to explain, right? Basically, the only state that the network stores is state that has been accessed, touched, edited within the last one or two years. If you have a piece of state that has not been edited within the last one or two years, then nodes in the network stop storing it. Now, it's still part of the blockchain, but it's like old historical state, right? So if you want to send a transaction that touches really old state, you have to provide a cryptographic proof called a witness that says, here is a, a, this cryptographic proof showing what is the last um, time that this particular object was touched and what was the state of that object when it was touched. And here is a proof showing that it has not been edited since then. And then you can kind of resurrect that state. You can bring it back and, and make a transaction using that state. And then you, you save a new copy again, right? So it's like state that has been accessed recently is still handled by the network, but state that is more than about one or two year old, the network itself does not handle it. And it's your responsibility to uh, kind of store that information and then prove that information if you want to do things with those, with those smart contracts. So that's state expiry. Mm -hmm. Is that is that kind of is that kind of an analogous thing to because the other option I've heard talked about is um, storage rental. Yes, it's a, mm -hmm. yeah, it's a it's a very similar category of ideas, right? It's a, I guess you can think of it as being like it's very similar to rent, right? Because instead, like rent basically says like for state to stay in this region of state that everyone is storing for you, you have to like pay you know x amount of ETH per block or per week or per month or however you do it. And state expiry just says, well, by paying the gas to kind of to poke an account, right, to read or write it, you are paying for its storage for one or two years. And then if you want to pay for more storage, you just have to keep poking it. And if you haven't poked it, then, well, it, uh, you know, goes into this expired state and, and then it's your responsibility to provide proofs for it. So, yeah, there are like state rent and state expiry, are like very, two very similar things, definitely the same family of solutions. And then after that, the other solution is statelessness. And statelessness basically says that like, we drastically reduce the number of nodes that have to actually store the state. So we say, well, okay, fine. You know, the state can grow to a terabyte. Well, we're, we don't care the state is a terabyte because, well, there's only going to be like a couple of hundred specialized nodes that actually have to store it. And everyone else instead like receives and verifies these cryptographic proofs, right? What we call witnesses that say, here are the objects that the transaction touched. And here is a cryptographic proof that says that these values actually are, cor are correct up-to-date values. And so you can use those proofs to actually verify that a block was uh, computed correctly and that a block was, uh, that the state after a block was uh, updated correctly. Um, so, so Mm -hmm. Could that pr could pr promote uh, laziness at all, or if you've got access to these kind of lighter clients? Mm -hmm. Yeah, like so. A big part of this is definitely enabling lighter clients, right? So I think, like in Ethereum, we deeply believe that for a blockchain to be decentralized, it needs to be possible for a diverse set of users to run nodes that are actually verifying the chain. And this is all about reducing how heavy your node needs to be to be able to verify the chain, right? So with state expiry, we're basically saying that. 
you know, your node only has to store state that was accessed in the last one or two years instead of storing old all historical state. And in a stateless uh, system, we're basically saying, well, your node does not have to store anything at all. Instead, it just has to have a little more bandwidth, like we're talking maybe a factor of like two to four times more bandwidth. And it has to do a bit more cryptographic work verifying these proofs. But instead, you know, you barely have to store anything on the hard drive. Actually, I think you don't even need a hard drive. You just like run a node that can store everything in RAM. Uh, so. In both cases, like it's about making nodes more, and node running more accessible to uh, average users. And that's something I, th I think a lot, you know, a lot of people who probably sort of perceive you incorrectly as sort of CEO of Ethereum uh, don't mm. realize that you've actually been uh, operating this sort of slutty bar fast uh, figure where you're supposed to be designing planets and actually you're tinkering away on glacial flow in Norway or something. And uh, but you've actually been, uh, I, I think, uh, contributing uh, to mm. the research around stateless Ethereum. Is it, that something uh -huh. that is still still in progress this year? It absolutely is. Actually, uh, this morning, like literally four hours before this presentation, I was in a call where I was uh, presenting this a new roadmap for um, you know mm -hmm. some very detailed specifications, kind of what I call a, a proto EIP, like uh, basically an EIP, but it has like probably fifty mistakes in it. The point uh, the point is to just to, like show people that there's something that's simple that's fully specified enough that you can implement it. And uh, that includes both statelessness and uh, state expiry. Uh, so that's something that's going to have a lot more work on it. It's likely to be a, a, the major priority after the merge. Very exciting. Um, before I hand back to uh, Richard, I'm just we're going to flash through. Uh, you've uh, recently been issued with a, a disarmingly simple instruction manual for fixing Ethereum. So I thought we might flash through <laughs> these various ideas mm. uh, now. Mm -hmm. So the first one is uh, what we might call the Elon solution. Uh, mm -hmm. which is increasing block size. What do you say to that? 15 seconds. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Uh, so Sorry, that's I think actually that's block, block time, by the way, that's uh, the time to answer. Right, right. No, I, uh, well, so he made two solutions, right? One was like increasing the block size and the other was decreasing the block time. Um, this kind of harkens back to this famous uh, Bitcoin block size war, right? Like basically, like the way that I summarize the block size war is like, do you value uh, the blockchain being easy to read? So being easy to write to run a node for, or do you value the blockchain being easy to write? So being cheap to send transactions for. And like the reason why there is a trade off, right? Is because the bigger the blocks are, the harder it is to read and ha have a node for the chain, but the more space you have. And so the lower transaction fees are going to be. And my position on that issue has always been um, that I, uh, to the frustration of many ideological purists, uh, call myself a medium blocker. Uh, so like, I think one to two megabytes is way too small, but I also think like Bitcoin SV style uh, 512 megabyte blocks is just like totally ridiculous and unserious as well. And uh, I think, uh, you know, if we don't have technology, then ultimately like we just have to have a medium sized blocks and we have to sacrifice a bit on both dimensions. So transaction senders <laughs> feel some pain and uh, node runners feel some pain and both sides share the pain so that one side doesn't have to feel too much pain. Um, but in the long term, like I, I view this as being something that can be solved through technology, right? Like for example, something like statelessness can allow the blockchain to support like potentially like three times more transactions without needing to ha actually have more pain for users running nodes. And then something like uh, moving the ecosystem to rollups that also allows uh, the, uh, um, allows you to still have full nodes and still have like full verification, but uh, without increasing pain for users running nodes, but you have like 50 to hundred times more scalability. And then sharding that also like gives another fifty to hundred times more scalability with once again without increasing pain for uh, users that are running nodes like uh, that much, right? Uh, so, like I view the trade off as being like I basically see it. Yeah, I view the trade off as being like with tech. You know, there is this trade off between reading the chain and writing to the chain, and I think if either one of those gets too expensive, uh, you le it just become leads to horrible centralization. Right, because if it, if it becomes too expensive to read the chain, um, I recently wrote this uh, blog post on my blog, uh, Vitalik.ca. Um, it is uh, um, 
uh, called The Limits of Blockchain Scalability. It was from uh, May, uh, where I uh, show this sort of nightmare story where you could have, um, you know, the like a, a, a small group of elites that are running a protocol basically just force a change on everyone against their will. And if you're not running a verifying node, like you, you as a user, like you don't really have a seat at the table and you don't really have a way to fight back. So that's one issue. But then the other issue is that if you don't value the ability to write to the chain, then instead of users being able to use the blockchain, you're going to have users just working through centralized intermediaries, right? And like, that's one of the things that we're seeing, like with, uh, you know, the whole El Salvador thing, for example, right? Like they're basically pushing users onto solutions where they're interacting with uh, Bitcoin in this very indirect way that still depends on this very centralized intermediary. And so, even though kind of the theoretical decentralization and uh, you know freedom and censorship resistance levels of the system are very high, the practical decentralization and uh, you know freedom and optionality as experienced by users is actually not that high because you have to uh, just have to rely on these intermediaries as a result of the structure of the system. Um, so I think that if you do not use advanced technology, you know you are stuck between a rock and a hard place. And the best that you can do is, is like basically have like half a rock and half a hard place, right? Like that's sort of what Ethereum is doing now, right? We're like, we're, we've been doing these uh, kind of careful and slow uh, gas limit increases. And uh, so we have five times more scalability than we did when Ethereum started. But at, this, uh, um, uh, but at the same time, you know, transaction fees are harder as well, right? So like running a node is harder than it was before. And uh, sending transactions is harder than it was before, but neither one of the two is like prohibitively too hard. Uh, but like that's not sustainable, right? Eventually, demand increases to the point where like you're going to get to the point where like both of those are prohibitively hard. Um, so the solution is like better technology, right? So statelessness, um, rollups, sharding, and uh, like actually like move the trade off frontier forward and get the best of both worlds. And then like, I, so to me, that is what blockchain, like responsible blockchain scaling is about. Yeah, I've got, I've got a quick follow up to that. Um, so you talked earlier about how, you know, high, high gas prices means you attract high value transactions. And as you just mm. pointed out, you know, as, as hopefully the fees come down a little bit, you know, volume will go up, um, but it'll still, you still got this kind of race between scaling and volume. Um, mm -hmm. and I wonder what you see, you know, if you look out, say, three to five years, what you actually expect to happen. Can you project, do you have targets for where you mm -hmm. want fees to go? And, mm -hmm. and is, is the answer ultimately, is it other blockchains? Is it interoperability between blockchains? I mean, can you achieve, mm -hmm. you know, on, on Ethereum? So I think five years from now, we're going to have sharding and we're going to have rollups. Rollups are a factor of 100 increase to scalability. Sharding is also a factor of 100 increase to scalability. So, you know, either fees go down by a factor of 10,000 or uh, usage goes up by a factor of 10,000, uh, which at this point is, on, is not going to happen, right? Because there's just so many people using the blockchain already. Or we're going to see some combination of both, right? And there's like 100 times more users and they're each paying 100 times less. Uh, so I think... Uh, that's like i am very optimistic that because like we have the we really have this very serious and powerful scaling technology and so we are going to be able to get to the point where you can interact with um the blockchain or like these layer two protocols that are very closely tied to the blockchain and that it still inherit the security of the blockchain. And so, you know, we are going to have fees that are low enough for not just DeFi, but lots of other things to operate as well. And uh, it's going to happen in a way that still benefits from the full security of right. Ethereum. I mean, obviously five years is a, is a very long way out in this industry. Everybody, mm. you know, I know he's, everybody wants to try uh, D, a DeFi application, and they're all shocked mm -hmm. by the gas prices. So, mm -hmm. uh, what do you think is going to happen in the next two years? Are, are we basically stuck in this in this zone for the next couple of years before you really see that scale? I don't think it's going to take a couple of years, and I think the the rollups are going to are looking like they're going to be ready for uh, in months, right? Uh, so, I think if even by the end of the year, the scaling situation is going to be uh, very different from what. Uh, where it is today and then it's just going to keep on getting even better as we uh, incorporate things like sharding um I, uh, and even today there's alternatives like there's things like polygon and like polygon isn't perfect right because its security model is not fully trustless you like you do have to trust 
the Polygon validator said. But like at the same time, it does exist. It does provide an EVM compatible environment. And the Polygon team is definitely very open to like incorporating like rollups and things and like other uh, kind of high security scaling solutions once the, techno the technology becomes ready. So, you know, if you want to start your application now and then, um, you know, migrate it over or have security increase over time as the technology for that increases over time, like that's also an option that exists today as well. Um, well, I, I want to step step back out uh, for a moment here and um, just kind of uh, maybe go up up a layer and look and look back at you know kind of what your priorities are and how you're spending mm. your time. Clearly, you know this you're deep in uh, an absolutely kind of vital time for Ethereum in in what mm. you're building, and you know it's all on your shoulders as the chief scientist here. But uh, how how are you spending your time? How much time are you spending just developing, building in, in the developer ecosystem, how much time are you spending out in the wider world doing, well, things mm -hmm. like this? I, I, get, I, I do some of everything, and I feel like I've done some of everything for a long time. Um, so I think what's been happening over the last couple of years is that like the need for me to do a uh, fundamental research, like coming up with proof of stake algorithms or coming up with sharding solutions has really decreased because uh, like we've really mapped out um, a lot of the design spaces for these things, right? Like we're pretty confident, for example, that like there's state channels, there's plasma, there's rollups, there isn't like some other fourth type of layer two scaling solution. Um, we've become confident that we can, we know what the sharding design space is like, and there isn't like some magically much better form of sharding that we're missing. Uh, we've become confident that we understand the proof of stake designs, and there isn't some magically much better proof of stake solution that we're missing. Um, so, the research side has really moved from conceptual to details. And I'm still involved in a lot of the details, but there's also many other people involved in the details as well. Um, so we've had amazing researchers in the team, like I know Justin Drake, Dan Red Feistein, uh, Danny Ryan, um, you know, Xiaowei, um, Carl uh, uh, Bakers, and you know, this big long list of, uh, kind of people in our uh, research uh, team that's also been working on uh, kind of figuring out some of those fine grains details. So I do some of that. Um, like, so for example, I've spent a lot of the last week on uh, statelessness and uh, state expiry, um, but uh, there's other people that are doing things as well. Um, so that's some of my time. Other parts of my time are definitely spent on thinking through uh, kind of more deep and conceptual issues. Um, so things like uh, decentralized governance is one big example, right? Um, like as we move from talking about decentralized finance to more generalized decentralized applications, you start having decentralized applications where there needs to be some kind of common way to agree on changes to protocol parameters. Um, also, in the ecosystem, there's a lot of public goods that need to be funded. Um, like, for example, there's code that needs to be written. There's uh, documentation that needs to be written. There's research that needs to be done. Um, there's education that needs to be done. And like the reason why these things are all public goods, right, is that they're not like products that you can go sell to individual people, right? There are things where, you know, either they're not there or you or they're out there and you they release them on the internet and they benefit everybody. And public goods are the sort of thing that it's like, you know, just in civilization in general, notoriously hard to figure out good mechanisms to kind of encourage people to build them and encourage people to build the right kinds of public goods. And so coming up with better ways of funding public goods has been one of these uh, challenges that I've been thinking about. And that problem has two sub problems, right? Like one sub problem is where the funding comes from. And the other sub problem is, well, what kind of mechanism do you use to actually decide where the funding goes? Uh, and you know which projects actually uh, uh, actually get supported. So we've done experiments in the Ethereum ecosystem, like Gitcoin grants, as one example. I know there's um, other experiments in the uh, Ethereum ecosystem. Moloch DAO is another example. CLR Fund is another example. There's been a lot of these that have been starting to pop up, and so. I've been try doing a lot of kind of thinking through, um, you know, what's going on in those ecosystems, how can they be improved further, and so forth. Um, so that's another example, um, just kind of thinking through, I guess, like bigger ecosystem uh, strategic questions, and then also, you know, talking to people, like talking to you guys right now. Um, so 
some of a lot of things. The, that question of governance is a fascinating one, and it you know we're we're in a period of massive experimentation, and yet mm. it sometimes seems to me we're not seeing as much experimentation in governance, or we're not hearing as much discussion mm. about governance as as I'd like to hear. And the, mm. and the, the the parallel I draw is with Facebook. You know, I mm. look at Facebook that grew from nothing to become this mm -hmm. massive thing, and then suddenly, hang on a minute, we have a governance problem. Let's invent. Mm an oversight board, with, mm -hmm. which is an incredibly messy, uh, mm -hmm. past kind of solution that nobody likes. And I look at, you know, what's happening in your world, and I see something that is starting to take off. And I see mm -hmm. people thinking about governance, but I don't see, you know, how are we going to bring in outside voices? How are we going to mm. make sure that we are representative? How are people going to trust us ultimately? And mm -hmm. governance is so absolutely key to all of this. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, what, you know, what are your thoughts? What, what, how do you square that mm -hmm. circle? How do you, how do you get outside voices in, um, you know, and help people feel confident that there is proper response or governance of these systems? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely think that the crypto space is uh, kind of much more inclined to uh, think seriously or at least have some kind of of, of uh, philosophy of uh, governance and at least understand that that's a legitimate question that needs to be answered to an extent that you know, kind of the centralized tech companies of, of the zero zeros definitely did not think about at all, um, okay. right? Like they... Uh, you know, did not think about trust models seriously. Their their world model was definitely one where um, you know everyone would just be willing to trust whoever was operating them, and that was. I mean, like you can kind of see how that would that makes sense in the context of a uh, of of this sort of world where there's sort of much less conflict and everyone is kind of feels like they're roughly on the same page. And I see how the world of 10 years ago looks more like that, but like the world of today is definitely a more chaotic one. And it definitely needs to like think much more explicitly and design systems with, especially with uh, the idea in mind that, um, you know, you are go going to serve a much larger community of users than the set of people whom you can, can you can successfully convince that you're a great guy and you can be trusted with everything. Uh, so, but I think one of my learnings from uh, just what we've seen in governance so far is that there isn't a, a silver bullet that you can kind of craft in pure theory land and uh, like just sort of figure out academically and then implement across the board. Like you can sort of do more of that in cryptography, right? Like in cryptography, um, you know, you can formally define what is a DK snark and you can come up with this fancy thing using well, using some fancy polynomials and you can, um, you know, actually mathematically prove that if you use these poly polynomials and stick them together in this particular way, then it gives you this thing called a ZK snark. With governance, you can't do that. And I think the reason why you can't do that with governance is that, um, like, there is this difference between what I call inside the model failures and outside the model failures. Uh, so. And inside the model failure is like you have a reasonably accurate model that kind of describes what's going on in the world using using some math, but then you just got the equations wrong, and that's why the thing breaks. And outside the model failures are when, well, it's not even about getting the math wrong. It's about like the math that you use to represent the world doesn't actually represent the world that well, and it doesn't capture everything that's going on. And like even in blockchains, like even in like consensus algorithms, for example, right? Like a lot of people talk like love talking about, you know, oh, this thing is formally proven and th therefore we know this is great. But like the reality is that there's even there plenty of outside the model failures that can happen, right? Like selfish mining, this uh, paper from 2013, a, a great example of an outside the model failure, right? Because the models up until that point didn't really even think about incentives. Um, and then you think about incentives and guess what? Your security drops from 50% to 25%. Uh, so, but with governance, like humans are so hard to model and the patterns in which some gr groups of humans are able to work together and how some groups of humans are more able to work together than other groups of humans. Like those are just things that we don't really have good models for, right? Like, you know, we talk about the notion of a 51% attack. Well, okay, so the system can break if 51% of people can collude, but like how likely is it that these 51% of people can collude? You know, are like, you know, 
there was a, a there was this picture of a panel in Hong Kong where you saw um, the miners representing ninety uh, percent of all the hash power, and they're just sitting together chatting on the same panel. Like, you know, can they collude? Yes, they can. The question is like, how likely are they to collude? And those are questions that are hard to answer. And so, like. What thinking about governance, like a lot of the knowledge that matters is knowledge that is very difficult to formalize. And it's only something that I think you can start to understand ahead of like over time as a result of experimentation. And this to me is like one of the best things about the crypto space. Like the crypto space allows lots of experimentation and it allows like lots of these things to happen. And like we can learn from these different experiments, right? Uh, so I think that approach is something that's much more likely to lead to something interesting than like step one, create something completely centralized. Step two, grow to 2 billion users. Um, and then step three, um, you know, you have half the world breathing down your neck, asking you to censor people. And then half the other world breathing down your neck, asking you not to censor people. And then like, you have to quickly scramble and come up with something that everyone's happy with. Right. Like, I think like, you know, governance has to grow with the system. Yeah, you know, and they like I, I I don't think it can be a bolt on of something that already exists. Yeah, no. yeah. Hmm. I mean, I, I mean, the Facebook comparison wasn't wasn't entirely serious because I fully understand mm -hmm. it's different. I think it's an interesting contrast, and this mm -hmm. question of whether governance can adapt is seems mm -hmm. to me an absolutely key one, because many institutions are defined by their initial governance. They don't mm -hmm. adapt. That's the whole point. And mm -hmm. um, whether Therefore, we need experimentation within blockchains like yours, or whether we just need more blockchains built on different mm -hmm. models until we mm -hmm. find one that's right. Is I think mm -hmm. yeah, to me, it's a very open question. Yeah, I, I think we need both, uh, and I think there's definitely experimentation within the blockchain space that we've learned from. Like, uh, I mean, like I've I've talked about the uh, the delegated proof of stake ecosystem, um, like EOS and uh, BitShares and those others, and how like I think there was. Like there was clearly a a, 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 a a at least somewhat of a well-intentioned vision behind uh, some behind the design, right? Like they uh, wanted blockchains that were more expansive, protocols that could adapt, protocols that could even include a decentralized court that could provide recourse if people's coins got stolen, um, a, a treasury that could fund public goods, and all of these things. But then it ended up quickly collapsing into this equilibrium where you just had like rich people bribing other rich people to vote for each other. And, you know, that was a negative result, but it was still a result that we learned from. And having like having even, even negative results that we can learn from is still something that I'm grateful for. So I'm definitely grateful that, you know, we, we do not have a blockchain monoculture and we have these different designs that we can learn from. Yeah. Um, I mean, is there anything that you're, any ideas you're toying with at the moment? Any ideas that you would like to implement you think would, would help Ethereum? Um, I'm interested in this question of how to fund public goods in the Ethereum ecosystem better. Um, so like I've been uh, helping the Gitcoin grants uh, community with uh, their own experiments. I know there's some roll-up projects that are interested in uh, kind of coming up with their own gadgets and their own ways for redirecting transaction fee revenue that they collect and like and, and using that to fund uh, kind of open source projects within the Ethereum ecosystem. Um, so that sort of stuff is one big area that I'm uh, definitely interested in. And I think the Ethereum layer two space is going to be an interesting uh, kind of gold mine for governance because uh, like there is an opportunity to have some governance and in part because you have a safety bar, right? And the safety bar basically is that you can have a governance design where you can eat like whatever the governance design is. Imagine you have a, a 60 day delay before any governance decision takes effect. Right. And so if a bad governance decision takes effect, then everyone can just like they have two months, they can leave the rollup and they can go to a different rollup. Um, so having that kind of a safety bar gives you an opportunity to have more activist governance inside of the rollup. And that more activist governance, it can change the protocol. It can ch direct like where um, transaction fee revenues are being sent to. It can do a lot of different things. Right. And so like how. Uh, I'm definitely expecting we're going to see a lot of interesting uh, governance experimentation uh, and happen there for all kinds of things. I'm, I'm looking forward to the results. And, hmm. So Vitalik, uh, talking of uh, protocol changes, uh, we've actually had just had a question in uh, from the audience hmm. uh, amongst many questions about, about ETH2. Um, hmm. 
I know you're trying to decommission the ETH2 brand a little bit or soften that up, but um, I think let's sort of stick to the language around the, around what we call the beacon chain. At the moment, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of those who have been following this have the sense that there's this great piece of uh, theater happening on Ethereum right now. The beacon chain launched, I think it's five months ago. We have this sort of six. image of a, a six months ago. Um, and we have this image of a, a sort of Python um, empty stomach uh, called the beacon chain about to devour the elephant of, uh, of mm. Ethereum uh, one. Um, and kind of wondering, well, how is it going to do that? So what are the logistics around this? First of all, what is, what is this beacon chain? What's the merge? Mm. When's it happening? Uh, and then I'd like to ask a couple of questions on on proof of stake as well. Sure. Uh, so the beacon chain is a uh, the Ethereum proof of stake chain. Um, it launched about six months ago, but it launched uh, so far as an independent chain. So if you want to become a validator on the beacon chain, you can still deposit your ether on the uh, existing Ethereum on the proof of work chain, and then you automatically get a validator slot on the uh, beacon chain. Uh, so right now it's just validating itself. And this is basically a warm up period to allow the staking ecosystem to mature, to give us more confidence that everything is technologically solid. And after uh, about uh, 12, well, when the merge happens, which is uh, ho hopefully going to be close to the end of this year, at this looking more likely to be on the, um, on the right side of the end of this year than the left side at this point. Um, but um, basically, that is uh, going to be this uh, event where uh, the existing proof of work chain is kind of grafted on top of the uh, proof of stake chain, right? And uh, proof of work is retired. So basically, it becomes this kind of chain inside a chain system where past the merge, every block on the existing Ethereum chain, there is no longer a requirement for it to have a valid proof of work solution, but there is a requirement for it to be embedded inside of a beacon chain block. Uh, so this uh, design is designed to be minimally disruptive. So it's designed so that existing applications and existing users can uh, just almost pretend that nothing has happened, right? Applications will keep running as is. Users don't have to do any kind of like explicit migration. You know, you don't have to move your ETH over to ETH2 because uh, like the existing Ethereum chain just like moves inside of the uh, beacon chain. Uh, and at the end of the procedure, like Ethereum will just be a pure proof of stake system. So can we talk briefly about proof of stake and the kind of relative oh. virtues? I mean, I think a lot of people are, are very familiar with the, you know, the environmental advantages. Um, I want to talk a little bit though about capital efficiency. Um, okay. So if we kind of regard, let's say, you know, mining hardware and digital stake uh, as mm -hmm. forms of the same class of capital, truth capital, or some future type of fixed income, or, or whatever we call it. Mm -hmm. um, how does proof of stake uh, improve the per dollar, per dollar efficiency of, of, mm -hmm. of that truth capital? What, what, what's its advantage? Right. Uh, so the advantage of proof of stake, right, is basically um, that both proof of work and proof of stake are like proof of economic resources, um, right? But their um, efficiency basically comes from like th the fact um, that you know you you're not just proving ongoing expenditure that you're doing at that time. You're also proving a large amount of capital expenditure, right? So in the case of proof of work, you're proving that you have hardware, and in the case of proof of stake, you're proving that you have these existing um, ETH deposits. And it turns out that like the higher the ratio of capital cost to ongoing cost, then like the more of a security margin you can get um, at a lower cost, right? So, like and with proof of stake, the uh, you you barely have any operating expenditure at all, right? It's pretty much entirely capital cost, and so you can have this very high level of uh, efficiency where you only need a very low reward to convince people to be able to to be willing to deposit their ETH onto the system and become stakers. And the security of the system, like it just the amount of uh, ETH that you need to do a 51% attack of it just is as high as that, as uh, the, that amount of ETH that got deposited, right? And so the amount of, uh, the cost of actually taking over the system is very high and the amount of rewards you need to pay to keep the system running is very low. Got it. So every dollar securing the system is kind of doing, doing more work in some sense. Okay, exactly. I could, could, could I just ask uh, so one question? I think, you know, I think it was, uh, I can't remember when you wrote this uh, paper, it was a while back on the notion of um, weak subjectivity, but um, when we kind of look at 
proof of stake, I suppose, particularly those of us who kind of live, uh, which most of us watching this today um, in liberal democracies, we're kind of accustomed to every statement being in some sense um, rebuttable if better information mm -hmm. comes to light. So we, you know, mm -hmm. if you think your policymakers have good integrity and then they're guilty of corruption, mm -hmm. they're, they're removed or, um, you know, big tech likewise, financial statements, the Enron scandal, etc. And, and then in science, that's how we kind of move from, let's say, Newtonian mechanics mm -hmm. to we find something that's strictly better and then we get rid of that old mm -hmm. assumption. Um, proof of work, you can definitely see how how it seems to have that one virtue, that one feature, mm -hmm. compared to versus the chain, one's got more work, one's got less work, both are mm -hmm. consistent and so I pick the one with more work. Um, mm -hmm. is, is that kind of rebuttable presumption is that is that eliminated with proof of stake? Is 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 there anything mm. that carries over at all? And how much should this right. kind of upset us? Um, mm. That's the mm -hmm. great virtues of you know environmental improvements and capital efficiency. Right. So proof of stake has this finality property, right? That basically once a block has been confirmed for like about twelve minutes, it becomes finalized, and at that point, it can never be reverted. Um, and that like that property has a lot of benefits, right? Because after you wait that short period of time, like you can just be very sure that, you know, yes, you've received your money and your money is not going to be taken away from you. Um, and so I think uh, in terms of your critique there, um, one important philosophical point about blockchains is that like the consensus mechanism is not an anything goes system, right? Like there is this concept of agreeing on blocks, but then there is this concept of validation. And validation is not just done by miners and validators, right? Validation is done by users. And this is also like a big part of why like we believe in, you know, decentralization and making it possible for users to run nodes and not just having this system where like, oh, you know, you have like a couple hundred staking nodes and otherwise we don't care if regular people can verify the chain. Um, like in a blockchain, even a majority of the users cannot force you to accept a chain that does not break the rules. If you want to change the rules, like that's not done through the consensus mechanism, that's done through everyone agreeing on downloading a patch to their client that changes the consensus mechanism. So agreeing on rules actually kind of sets a layer above consensus. And so like if users actually are verifying, then you know there, there is no possibility of users accepting a block that breaks the rules as it being finalized like at, at any point, right? So kind of the function of rule enforcement is actually done at this even higher and sturdier level than uh, the function of agreeing like, well, which particular history actually is it that we're gonna choose? All right. One, uh, so we're getting we're getting towards the end of our time, and you know, please, if anybody has further questions, post them. We'll try and rattle through a few later on. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to step back just one more time and ask about you know, looking forward, some of the applications. We talked a little bit about DeFi and NFTs. Um, I'm very very interested in kind of the macro impacts. Um, you know, mm -hmm. the impact on money of blockchains like this and. Uh, um, so I noticed that, you know, you gave an interview to one of my colleagues, Chloe Cornish, three years ago. And at the mm -hmm. time, you said you'd been talking uh, to Moscow about, you know, a digital ruble mm -hmm. idea of, I think since then, the idea of central bank, you know, digital currencies has become a really hot mm -hmm. topic, one of the great mm -hmm. things we look forward to. So what happened to the digital ruble? And are these, mm -hmm. are these, are these things going to become real soon? And will they be on Ethereum or should they be? Mm -hmm. Oh, no. I I'm definitely like a bit less optimistic about the CBDC space uh, than I was a, a couple of years ago. Like basically, I think like what we've seen so far, right, is that like, first of all, that anyone who has actually tried to uh, come up with uh, CBDCs, like people within governments, they, for whatever, like, in, like, or various institutional reasons, end up coming up with something that's like, one, not very blockchain-y. Right? Like for something to be a blockchain, it needs to at least have Merkle proofs, right? Like you need to at least have, be able to have a cryptographic proof that you made a transaction. And like, I've, I don't, I don't, I have not seen any evidence that like DCAP supports that kind of feature. I have not seen any evidence that like some, and that a lot, the, a lot of these other CBDCs support that feature. So like, there isn't really this notion of open verifiability. And once you don't have even that notion of open verifiability, like you're just basically saying, you know, the government operates a glorified PayPal. And there's reasons why the government operating a glorified PayPal is macroeconomically interesting. Um, but 
at the same time, the other thing that we've noticed is that like even DCP itself, right? Like the that's not run directly by the the Chinese government. It's actually like run by this uh, kind of partnership where it's still like basically intermediated through some financial institutions. And so at that point, and like a lot of the other proposals for a CBDC is they often end up kind of like getting stuck on this question of like, well, you know, they don't actually feel like disintermediating the banks. And so it turns into a system where banks are still run are, are still running it. And like what you get at the end is just something that's not that different from the pay the status quo of payments, right? Like at the, I mean, there uh, sometimes they even have the concern that like, okay, you know, this could even be a step backwards in terms of privacy, for example. Um, so, like, I think there is definitely like the theoretical possibility of a uh, CBDC done well, um, but at the same time, like, well, I mean, what we what we've seen so far, I think, like, it does not yet have, uh, um, or has not yet shown uh, too much of that, and you know, it may well be that like it just is the uh, kind of non institutional uh, kind like crypto DeFi stable coin space itself that actually, the, that's able to come up with uh, the more innovative things. And then those get sort of grafted onto um, becoming more mainstream parts of the financial system over time. Right. I mean, not very mm. blockchain-y sounds like a very good description of what Facebook is currently doing. Mm. With they started out with something different. Is there a chance right. that have much impact? Well, I think that the, the challenge with uh, Libra, right, is that like, I know there were some well-intentioned people inside that team and they wanted to come up with something that, um, you know, has some kind of like multi-stakeholder, multinational governance that's credibly not uh, controlled by Facebook, but they pretty much like totally failed at convincing anyone that that's what it actually is. And, uh, and so like it got interpreted as just being Facebook and then, I mean, the U.S. has definitely like the the regulatory environment has uh, taken this sort of nationalistic turn where, you know, they're more suspicious of things that are not like actually based inside the U.S. And so I guess uh, DM felt uh, forced to uh, or Libra renamed itself to DM and felt forced to uh, kind of rebase itself uh, inside of the U.S. instead of being based inside of Switzerland, which uh, like I can see how that makes U.S. regulators happier. But on the other hand, like I think that's going to severely reduce the risk that this sort of system will be met with enthusiasm in uh, jurisdictions outside the U.S. and especially jurisdictions that are not like super friendly to the U.S. Uh, so like I do think that the dream of some kind of like truly global and uh, a uh, kind of like uh, Fi like stable financial infrastructure is just something that the yeah, non-institutional -inst uh, uh, kind of stable coin uh, de decentralized portion of the crypto space is just going to have to come up with and do the best that it can at. Got it. All right. I'm going to hand back to Tom for one or mm. two final thoughts from him, and then we're going to go to the audience questions. So, I was going to uh, ask a couple mm. of questions uh, about uh, leadership and uh, unsought power. Mm. So, uh, there's a novelist you may not have heard of called uh, Jack Higgins from my old home island of Jersey, uh, mm. where the, I think the Eagles landed. And he's once asked on um, a UK radio show called There's Lila and Discs, uh, mm -hmm. what do you wish you'd known as a child? And he said, well, I, I wish I'd known that when you reach the top, there's nothing there. Mm. Um, a bit bleak, but you didn't really ask for all this. Um, is there a sort of altitude sickness uh, that you've suffered, um, finding yourself this sort of cult figure at the center of technology that seems mm. very likely to achieve ubiquity in the world. Has that been quite disorienting? Yeah, no, th there's definitely some loneliness out of that. And uh, there's definitely some kind of like loss of freedom that I guess inevitably comes with that. Um, I guess, uh, but, you know, at the same time, like it's this position where like, I, well, we have as, uh, well, I guess you're also theoretically a top 100 uh, crypto person, according to like whatever that organization was. But like, you know, we do have a, this uh, opportunity to uh, uh, kind of 
significantly affect what uh, actually ends up happening inside of the crypto space and what kinds of things get built here. And there's an opportunity to build really good and really important things. And there's also a, a, a possibility that if everything fails, it'll just kind of decay into, um, you know, a couple of uh, casinos yelling at uh, uh, proponents of uh, the opposing casino, and then the whole space will just not be very interesting. Yeah. And, and so, you know, we have an opportunity, but that's also a responsibility, right? It's a big responsibility to actually ensure that or, or, or do our best to uh, ensure that uh, the things that we dream of, uh, the, of uh, the crypto space leading to are things that actually happen. And a lot of those things are not things that happen by themselves. Like they're things that actually require kind of explicit effort and, you know, explicit thought leadership and then explicit action to make sure that they actually end up happening. Got it. And, a, and a kind of a, I said, a related question to that is, um, you know, I mean, although Ethereum is very much a um, science first uh, enterprise, kind of faith mm. basically operates at every layer of the stack from you know, the value beef, uh, the cryptographic assumptions, uh, mm. the engineers, the auditors and uh, and in the high priest. Mm. And um, are there kind of many moments that you have when you're supposed to be this chief evangelist that's supposed to be your, part of your remit? Uh, but mm -hmm. your zeal, uh, if, if not your faith, kind of falters a, a little bit. Mm. Uh, I mean, there, there's definitely moments where I worry about things. Um, but I don't know. I guess uh, when you worry about things, like, what do you do? Like, you just uh, figure out what the steps are to start moving toward fixing them and kind of just uh, get in, gets to work actually doing that. Uh, I'm... Hmm. To, to add my own last thought here, um, you know, what, what I'm really struck by uh, listening to you is what I, what I kind of interpret as a faith in humanity, that very mm. often when you talk in, about blockchain and crypto, it's all about the code. The co you know, if you have a problem, the code will solve it. And, you know, the world feels that it's been, it's had enough solutionism from the technology industry. Admittedly, you know, circa 2000 era tech companies, as you mentioned, and I, which is not what you're doing. But mm -hmm. nonetheless, you know, this idea that you can't solve it all by code, that knowing what the limits are, how humans can govern the code and, you know, how you can introduce mm -hmm. it or not introduce it, seem to mm -hmm. be the, kind of the really big questions. And I'm just really interested in kind mm -hmm. of how you feel about humanity's ability to handle this technology, this technology and AI and all the other powerful things that are crashing over us so fast. I mean, am I, am I wrong or are you just a real deep believer in humanity? Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely optimistic about humanity. Um, I think, uh, you know, again, despite all of the, uh, all of the kind of uh, various uh, frequent conflicts and misalignments that end up happening and that um, you know the media often loves to focus on because uh, they're the most fun thing to focus on there are still I think you know the human story of, as a whole is one of uh, just ever growing up progress and uh, cooperation and uh, I think almost everyone would much rather be you know in the current century than the one before and and in that one than uh, the one before that uh, so I'm I'm optimistic that uh, th things will uh, keep getting better. Uh, and I definitely don't think that like technology by its uh, like any particular technology by itself can kind of magically in some you know determ like technological determinist way uh, ensure that outcome. I do think that it's not just a question of technology. It's also just a question of like choices that are made by people. And that aspect is important too. Um, so I think, uh, you know, we, uh, it needs to do well on both of those fronts. Well, mm. thank you very much. I mean, we covered a, a huge amount of ground. I'm going to go through mm. some of the questions now and um, that have been pouring in. And Tom may have seen mm -hmm. some that he caught his eye too. But you know, maybe we can mm -hmm. see these we can pack in. So, first one uh, from an anonymous uh, audience member. So, how does Ethereum compare to upcoming? chains like Algorand, and maybe I can broaden that out, you know, which, which other blockchains have really caught your eye and you think are doing something mm. interesting? Mm -hmm. I mean, Algorand is definitely one of the uh, kind of technically interesting ones. Like they have, a, you know, a unique consensus model. They have a, a unique model for how, um, uh, for what their economics are and for, and for how they're trying to 
achieve things like scalability. Um, I mean, Avalanche is also interesting as well. Uh, I mean, like blockchains that make a kind of novel technical experiments or alternatively blockchains that make novel economic and governance experiments are always uh, the things that I'm the most excited about. Um, the kinds of chains that I'm less excited about are just like the ones that take the kind of the Elon Musk route of like 10 times bigger blocks, 10 times less often and kind of hand wave away and like talk about how uh, decentralization doesn't actually really matter that much. Um, the um, so I, mean, I, I definitely think that there's interesting things happening and there's even things that ethereum itself can learn from right like i and just like bls signatures as one example like that started as an idea that divinity people are really focusing on and then now that sort of made its way into ethereum 2.0 land and it's made its way into um, a lot of other blockchain uh, environments as well uh, so I think uh, no, the ecosystems do learn from each other as well. Okay, I have to ask you. And this is a question for me: Has Elon Musk been a good thing or a bad thing for crypto? He's created incredible kind of awareness. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, and he's created awareness, and then he's also created, um, you know, his own uh, kind of delightful jokery chaos in uh, the way that he, uh, I guess, uh, loves to do. Um, I think, uh, in my view, on kind of Elon's. Uh, a kind of effect on the space is um, that, you know, to the extent that adoption, like more attention is good, like that's great. Um, to the extent that the chaos is bad, like that's bad in the short term, but it also does, uh, like in the longer term, just help the ecosystem uh, sort of get stronger, right? Like an ecosystem is not healthy if it, uh, you know, if it can't handle the disruptions. Um, if prices go up for too long without going down, then whenever they do finally go down, they just go down even more. Um, I even, you know, things like Dogecoin, like I'm super pro Dogecoin. I think just like Dogecoin needs to just continue to exist just, just to remind the crypto space to not take itself too seriously. Right. It's like sometimes in the crypto space, you know, you got all of the maximalists that are like, no, this space isn't about having fun. This space is about the last hope of freedom for hu for humanity. And it's about ensuring that humans can have self-sovereignty and protect human rights. And we're going to liberate people from the from the fiat inflationism and the authoritarianism and the oppressors. And then like, but 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 this coin has a dog. <laughs> like, yeah, you know, we need we need the dog, right? Like, and, uh, so I think uh, you know it's. Uh, I mean, obviously uh, unhealthy if once people start kind of cynically making you know there's scam coin dogs that are just there to make their creators like five billion dollars. But at the same time, like we need the dog, and like we need the Elon to promote the dog. So I'm, um, I don't know. I'm like, I guess uh, you know, no hard feelings against either Elon or the dog either. <laughs> Indeed. Well, there's a lot of misrule. Uh, it's kind of an interesting role he's, he's cast for himself. But, you know, you you contrast that with the idealist view of, of uh, you know, what blockchains are for. I guess I would contrast it with money, people's investments, people mm -hmm. losing money. And, I you know, mm -hmm. I, I fully get the kind of meme stock and the meme coin vibe mm -hmm. moment that people are enjoying. But, you know, mm -hmm. it, it, people will misuse that. People are misusing mm -hmm. that. People are losing mm -hmm. real money. I mean, maybe I'm just being too purist about this. But yeah, I, mean, and, uh, I think that's the. <laughs> the I, mean, I think that's true as well. Um, and though at the same time, like as I said, I think that like it's hard to tell whether or not like a bit of chaos being injected into the ecosystem is a net positive or a net negative because sometimes it's a net negative, but sometimes it's like a vaccine, right? Like you know, you take your shot, your shot of chaos from. Uh, uh, of, you know, you take your Elona vaccine and then, uh, you know, the markets feel a little bit sick and you know, for a couple of days and they're bobbing up and down. And then, you know, eventually when you get a much bigger shock, like, uh, you know, people are not going to be so scared because like they get, you know, they know that shocks are a thing that happens and they're less likely to uh, just kind of go all in and make the irresponsible decisions. So like, I don't know, it's hard to, it's, it's, it's just really hard to tell whether or not like the uh, effect of any particular thing in a chaotic system is going to be positive or negative. Um, so I think like my wish for the system is just that like I think the unhealthy thing is when it grows too quickly and uh, you know when it makes these uh, kind of big leaps in growth that, that the ecosystem just isn't ready for. Um, so like the thing that's healthy is when uh, you know the bubbles get popped a little earlier on. The thing that's not healthy is when you know you have celebrities pumping things up 
and uh, eventually things uh, just uh, uh, kind of completely crash later on, right? Like, uh, you know, there's definitely, a, like the dog coins at least are fun, but there's plenty of things that are just like totally scammy and they're not fun, right? Like, you know, you have like Kim Kardashian and Floyd Mayweather promoting Ethereum Max and like, if my, I mean, Ethereum Max is just a, like a scam coin. It's probably not going to have any value at all, like four years from now. Um, so, I, I, I don't know. I do think that those celebrities should be ashamed for the, ashamed of themselves for, for, for promoting that sort of stuff. Um, uh, but uh, understood. Yeah. I'll say that to, to 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 that end, uh, immunization in this industry seems to last four years max. Um, mm -hmm. We do have two questions. Actually, can I ask them in parallel, just so because I I know uh, Richard needs to mm -hmm. Richard Biohead needs to wrap up as well. Um, so one was I got asked a question on how much are you think about post quantum at this point. Actually, we had a panel on that uh, earlier today with uh, Ellie, uh, mm. which was uh, from Starkware. And um, mm -hmm. uh, so obviously we've got Lamport signatures for signatures, but for, for the rest, it's obviously hashes are nice and safe. Mm -hmm. But how much do you think about the sort of the post quantum problem? Um, right. How urgent do you feel that is? And then the other one is mm. uh, I think I know what they're thinking. Uh, someone wants to know about EIP IRP one five five nine. So I think they want to know when they're uh, when their uh, inflation uh, mm -hmm. uh, rate is being adjusted. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, Sorry, so I a, think that was a timing question, by the way. So they want to know when the London hard fork is is it still on for July? Yeah, yeah. Like you know, yeah, end of July is like I think looking like the uh, approximate target date right now. Um, I think uh, the test net forks have been set, and they're they're going to happen over the next few weeks. Um, as far as uh, post. Uh, quantum stuff like technologically, right? Like we have Lamport signatures, we have uh, Starks for zero knowledge proofs, um, aggregate signatures. Like we theoretically have uh, Starks, but the question is like, I think it's a matter of just making them efficient enough, right? Because like BLS aggregation is really efficient, and Starks right now are not that efficient. So if we can improve the efficiency of like Stark based signature aggregation more, then that would obviously be amazing as well. Um, well, the nice thing about lattice-based cryptography, right, is that it gives us these very powerful primitives, like fully homomorphic encryption, obfusc obfuscation, and all these things, and it is quantum safe, which is just amazing. Like, that's way better than I was ever hoping for. Um, the is challenge... Really homomorphic encryption? Is that... Is well, that still... Blockchains don't strictly need it, but there are app applications that are kind of around blockchains. So like one example, right, is that if you're a light client and you want to get information about the blockchain without leaking huge amounts of information to a server, then you could use private information retrieval to uh, get that information potentially. But like if you want to do that efficiently, then, you know, that's uh, like using fully homomorph or using homomorphic encryption with lattices is like one of the better ways of doing it. Um, and then obfuscation is something that potentially does have some powerful um, applications, including some powerful ones on chain. And that also depends on lattices. And then there was the the the, the London, the, yeah, the London time question, which I think you answered. So thanks very much. Mm -hmm. hmm. Vitalik, um, you talk eloquently, I think, about public goods and the importance of public goods. A question from mm -hmm. Jim in the audience. Um, when you think about financing public goods, what, what role can ETH and other blockchains play in solving greenhouse gases and other real world problems? Are there applications, mm. you think? Well, so step one, of course, is converting to proof of stake so we're not part of the greenhouse gas problem. Mm -hmm. um, and then as far as like public goods in general, I, mean, I think blockchains are an excellent uh, ground for this kind of institutional and governance innovation. And like social innovation more general, right? So like we've been like charity NFTs are one example that we've seen a lot, right? Like I think if we can just like take the money that that people are willing to just like spend on with frivolous fun things and like direct that to like all, uh, to supporting just all kinds of charities, then that's like already a significant improvement in uh, you know how efficient the world can be, right? And like we've been seeing a lot of NFTs, right? Like there was that one that I think I forget the name, but it was some charity in India. Paul Graham retweeted it, and it got like a million dollars or or one to two million dollars. Um, the uh, there was a Doge NFT that got sold recently for about two or three million. Um, so like just experiments like that, where we just take cases where like you know people are already willing to just kind of throw around money for fun and we could just kind of like redirect that to do something useful. Like blockchains are an excellent uh, kind of ground for experimentation, a ground for implementing some of those things. And like that could end up, end up funding some uh, 
potentially really uh, useful and valuable things. So that's one example. Um, another example is that I think some of the governance uh, ideas like quadratic funding is one example that are being experimented with inside of the Ethereum space could potentially be kind of exported and applied outside of the Ethereum space as well. And like that's already being done to some extent, right? Like Gitcoin has been doing some experiments in uh, Colorado for a, like local uh, business uh, uh, funding. Uh, they've been, uh, I think, interested in doing that in other cities as well. I know there's projects that wants to do this for to fund like things like local media to, uh, as uh, one example. Uh, so I'm hoping that some of those experiments are going to uh, look feedback into the wider world as well. And then also, I think like crypto projects themselves, right? Like at some point, I, I I definitely have some hope that they're going to start funding public goods. Like that, like once their constituencies become large enough, because their size becomes large enough, they're going to start funding not just public goods within their own ecosystems, and not just public goods within the Ethereum ecosystem, but public goods having to do with the broader world as well. And I think that's the sort of thing that that there's just going to start to be a sort of demand and pressure for naturally as uh, these things have a uh, kind of larger and more mainstream I mean, of sets of users. I think that's uh, that's an inspiring note to finish on. You know, Vitalik, when you were talking earlier, one example you gave, you said, you know, you can't really imagine. I mean, what, what's the likelihood that a bunch of people sitting around a table will collude if they have the power to collude? And I couldn't help thinking maybe it's a journalist in me. They will collude. They will find a way if it's in their interest, such as human nature. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you know what you're grappling with here, and the issues you're grappling with are so fundamental. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm glad we can finish with a with a, an inspiring hope for a, you know how this technology can be used. Mm -hmm.